Felicitous greetings, fellow fanatics. Ever since Sputnik first launched, mankind has rapidly spun wild yarns fantasizing about traveling the stars. Whether it be guardians of peace and justice in a galaxy far, far away, a scrappy group of political prisoners fighting for their freedom against an Orwellian Earth-born dictatorship that seeks to reclaim their colonies, or massive fleets clashing against one another on an epic scale that a single planet could never logistically support, the space opera genre has long been a source of entertainment. Hello everyone, I'm Adam the Fanatic, also known as Mario Fanatic 15, and today I'm going to be wrapping up Sega Month by taking a look at Fantasy Star 4 The End of the Millennium, a JRPG made for the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive depending on which part of the world you grew up in. Though I did grow up playing other RPGs, in particular the Final Fantasy games, I never really had a chance to get into Fantasy Star. I did play the original for a little bit on GameTap, but I never got far enough into the game to say anything of substance on it. Thus, this is effectively my first encounter with the series. Unlike Final Fantasy, Fantasy Star 4 was meant as the third game in a trilogy. Thus, this review will not only be a chance for me to see how well the game holds up without nostalgia goggles, but also to see how well someone can jump in if they're not familiar with the two previous titles. Do be warned that as a sequel, this review may contain spoilers for Fantasy Star 1 and 2. As I've not played those games, I can't say definitively. Once again, I'll be playing through this on the Sega Mega Drive and Genesis Classics Collection, an official emulator available on Steam. Fantasy Star 4 is a pretty archetypical JRPG. You'll go through a story during quests as you trek across multiple worlds within the Algo system, starting off on the second planet, Motavia. Or should that be the first planet now, since the opening crawl makes it clear that the first planet, Parma, was destroyed approximately 1,000 years ago. Regardless, you'll take on the role of Chaz Ashley, a rookie hunter working under the best the guild has to offer, Alice Brangwyn. Much like the series' numerical rival, Final Fantasy IV, you'll have various other characters joining and leaving your party at key points in the story, each with their own strengths, weaknesses, and abilities that they bring to the table, and their own equipment, techniques, and skills that they can use in combat. There is some degree of overlap with characters, though each has enough differences that no two are quite the same. The battle system is pretty straightforward as far as JRPGs go. You select what you want your party to do in a menu, and then your characters and the enemies will exchange blows to pay on their agility with some degree of randomness thrown in. In addition to normal attacks using your weapons, you'll also have the option to use techniques and skills. Techniques work more in the fashion you'd expect of JRPGs, each drawing on a common pool of technique points, or TP, with more powerful techniques requiring more TP. Skills, on the other hand, work more in a traditional pencil-and-paper RPG style, where each has a number of times you can use it before needing to rest again. I do find it a little odd that the game decided to use both these systems instead of sticking with one or the other, but it never detracts from the game. If anything, it gives you more options in battle, which is always welcome. Additionally, certain sequences of skills and or techniques will allow characters to perform combination attacks, allowing them to perform more powerful moves than they would be able to carry out alone. They're cool to see, but can also be a little unreliable. Because each character attacks in randomized order, sometimes the characters you need to pull off an attack won't act together, as they can be interrupted not only by enemies between their turns, but even by their own allies. You can partially get around this with the macro system. This allows you to set up a turn ahead of time, which will force your party to act in the order you tell them to, though they will still be limited by the speed of the first character to act, and combos can still be interrupted by enemies in this case. I understand that it's a risk versus reward situation, but this feels like an awkward way to introduce such. Why can't you just tell the party to act according to the slowest character's speed in the combo so that they're guaranteed to work together? As you fight, you'll gain experience points, allowing your characters to level up and increase their stats over time. You don't have any control over how they grow, but as time goes on, in addition to simply increasing in power, you'll also gain new skills and techniques to use, as well as increase the number of times you can use them before needing to rest up. You'll also be able to buy and find various equipment along the way to upgrade your arsenal and armor alike. Of course, just as with any RPG, all the best gear is found not in shops, but rather by exploring the various dungeons you'll be trekking through. There aren't any fake walls in the game, so just be observant and explore each area in full, and you shouldn't miss anything important. You'll eventually gain access to three vehicles to help you traverse the planets. 
combat is simplified when you're in a vehicle, you automatically repair the hull to full strength after each fight. They are kind of cool to see at first, but the main draw of the vehicles is that they'll allow you to more quickly and more fully explore the overworld. Er, overworlds. Then we have presentation. Music feels a little out of place. For both high fantasy and space opera, I suppose I'm just used to powerful orchestral themes. While you obviously aren't going to get a true orchestra on a mid-90s cartridge, games like Final Fantasy and Legend of Zelda did an excellent job of imitating such with what they had, to say nothing of movie-based games that imitated their film soundtracks. Graphically, the game holds up pretty well. I do find the camera angle for battles a little odd, staring at your party's back as they fight against the monsters, but both your characters and the enemies of the like are fairly well detailed and in this manner, it actually beats out Final Fantasy, as enemies actually have proper attack animations. Now, if only we could get a game that combined Final Fantasy side view with the detailed animations of Fantasy Star 4, then we'd have an amazing looking game. A pity I don't have any footage of Bahamut Lagoon to share, that would definitely fit the bill. While on the subject of graphics though, I do feel I need to mention, do not buy this game if you have epilepsy. You'll be fine through most of it, but the final dungeon is just a seizure waiting to happen. I know that all video games are required to have an epilepsy warning, but this one definitely needs it. Of course, what would a JRPG be without a narrative? Fantasy Star 4 has no shortage of dialogue, and even has an introduction on a clifftop that I swear is paying homage to the original Final Fantasy. The game takes place exactly 1,000 years after Fantasy Star 2, and as a newcomer to the series, this is a boom. This means that the party is just as ignorant of the situation as the player is, and allows them to ask questions about what's going on without relying on the overused animation protagonist device. As you've no doubt already noticed, many scenes are accented with these stills, and there's quite a few of them throughout the game, giving you a number of comic-like cutscenes that both allow characters to be represented better than sprites alone can do, and also gives the game a unique player that I've not seen in other JRPGs of the time frame. Characters all have their own unique personalities, and it's especially fun to watch as Chaz grows over the course of the game. And here we come to the part of the review where I'll be discussing the plot. If you wish to avoid spoilers, please skip ahead to the time coordinates indicated on screen. Initiate temporal distortion... now. Still with me? Then don't say I didn't warn you. As mentioned before, the story begins on the planet Motavia with Chaz undertaking his first mission as a hunter under the wing of Alice, a skilled veteran of the trade. Natural disasters and monsters alike have seen an uptick in recent times, so they have no shortage of work. Their first task is given to them by the principal of Piata Academy, whose basement has suddenly been overrun by monsters, though he's very evasive when asked for more information on the matter. Before they can set out on their task, a scholar named Han insists on joining them bringing them news that a research team sent to Birth Valley has never returned, and the principal refused to send a team to investigate what might have happened to them. The trio venture into the basement and eventually come across strange equipment meant to contain the monsters, and with that, decide to press the principal for more information. It's revealed that the capsules came from the aforementioned Birth Valley, brought back by the team on their first expedition to investigate the source of the monster outbreak, but after they went back to continue their investigation, they never returned. Shortly thereafter, a sorceress man named Zeo threatened the principal, ordering him not to send any more expeditions into the valley. From there, the first major segment of the game involves a series of quests that eventually allow you to explore Birth Valley. When first you arrive at the entrance to the valley, more of a cavern really, you find that everyone in the surrounding town of Zema, including the research team, has been turned to stone. Alice knows of a cure, but for that, the party has to travel south to the city of Malcolm. However, it's not to be. When they arrive there, they find the city reduced to nothing more than rubble. Within the ruins, they meet Rune, a mage whom Alice has a crush on. Though we never get any details on exactly how they know each other, Rune informs the group that this, too, is the work of Zeo. However, there is another place they can find the cure, the city of Tono. Rune seems to have matters to tend to with the village elder, but a warrior of their village named Grizz joins the party in his stead, holding a personal grudge against Zeo for the death of his parents, and anything that sets back the mysterious sorcerer's plans is a win in his book. After securing the antidote, the team returns to Zema, using it to free the citizens from their stony prisons and restore them to life. But the victory is short-lived. Before anyone even has a chance to properly rest, monsters begin to flood out from Birth Valley, forcing the trio to investigate deeper. Once past the cavernous entrance, the team comes across the first of many ancient facilities that are still in partially working order. 
a relic of a bygone age from when the peoples of the Algo system traveled between worlds to interact with one another. Eventually they meet Rika, a young woman that was born and raised within the facility. And when I say young woman, I mean that her age is literally listed as one. Apparently, Newmans don't spend long at all as children, or maybe Octavia's years are just really long. Regardless, the plant's central computer, Seed, begins to explain things. Seed is one of many computers tasked with controlling the ecology of Motavia. However, he has lost control of his own systems, and the other systems have similarly been sabotaged, causing the numerous disasters that have been plaguing the planet. In order to shut down the systems, we'll need to rescue an android named Demi that's currently being held captive by Zia. With that, the party sets off, and just as Rika is appreciating the sky and fresh air for the first time in her life, Seed self-destructs to ensure his system cannot be corrupted any further than it already has. The party makes their way to Zio's fort. They manage to free Demi, but as is to be expected, Zio is there just as they're trying to make their escape. Zio reveals that his goal is nothing less than the complete genocide of every living creature within the Algo system, working for an ominous being that he worships as a god called Dark Force. Dark Force? Really? Th that's what we're calling the big bad here? I mean, you might as well just call it the big bad then. <sighs> just... Just play the clip. <laughs> you don't know the power of the dark side. At this point, you're forced into an unwinnable battle, after which Zeo strikes Alice with a wave of dark energy. The party makes a hasty retreat at this point, returning to Han's hometown of Krupp. He and his fiancée, Saya, give her lodgings and agree to take care of her as she heals while the rest of them, including Demi, travel to La Ada Tower at Alice's urging in order to find Rune in hopes that he may know some way of fighting against Zeo. Once the party meets up with Rune, he informs them that he's already working on securing the Cycle One, which will allow them to confront Zeo and Nervous, the central computer of the planet's various environmental systems, which Zeo's tower has been built atop of. Once they reach the top of Leida Tower, they're attacked by one of Zeo's minions, a make quick work of the creature. After that, Rune and Rika both seem to have a premonition of sorts. Maybe it's a translation error, the game never seems to explain how, but the two of them simply know that Alice is unwell, so the party rushes back to Krupp. The team arrives just in time to let Alice say her last goodbyes. I must say, this is probably the best the storytelling gets in the game. Stills do a really good job of showing everyone's emotions, both as she dies and when they're standing over her grave. And it doesn't stop there. You have Chaz standing on a balcony that night and pondering everything. Rune and Rika each talk to him in turn, and I must say, this scene is handled really well. They don't merely use her death as a plot device, they really give it the time and weight it needs to properly explore everyone's emotions. From there, the party ventures beneath Zio's castle to fight him at the heart of Nervous. Zio pulls a, but I'm invincible, moment as he dies, and the party has a bittersweet victory. Demi merges with Nervous to shut down the planet's environmental systems, Grizz parts with them now that he's had his revenge against Zeo, but for Chaz, Rika, and Rune, their journey is just beginning. Dark Force is still out there somewhere. Now in control of Nervous, Demi manages to activate a nearby spaceport, as well as the planet's last remaining space shuttle, allowing the trio to take to the orbital platform, Zelen. Upon Zelen, the party meets Red, the android that both Demi and Rika have been in contact with, and a friend of Seed's. It appears that it's not just Motavia that's afflicted, as the other remaining planet of the Algo system, Dezorus, is experiencing similar problems, caused by the space station Karan, which is causing the environmental systems of both planets to run amok. The group then head to the satellite to fight Dark Force for the first time. Yes, I said, first time. From there, things get a little repetitious as disabling Karan does nothing, so the party tries disabling the Climate Control Center which still doesn't stop the blizzards, so then they set out to try and enter the mysterious Garuberg Tower. Things aren't that simple, however. When they arrive, their path is barred by carnivorous trees that regrow whenever they destroy them. Cut off one head. Two more shall take its place. The party then travels to the Esper Mansion to meet with the mysterious Lutz, a sage that supposedly fought against Dark Force 2,000 years ago when it first appeared in the Algo system only to find out that they already knew him, in a sense. Rune is apparently endowed with the skills and memory of Lutz, though he's still his own separate person. This is why he's capable of using magic, which, much like space travel, has long been lost to the people of Algo. 
Using Lutz's memories, Rune informs the others that they can destroy the trees with the holy fire of the Eclipse Flame. So they venture to the Gumbius Temple that is entrusted with Guardian. And wouldn't you know it, they arrive just in time to see it stolen. Dark Force's ancient servant, Lashiek, who was apparently the final boss of the original Fantasy Star, holds a grudge against Rune as he's the not-quite-reincarnation of Lutz and challenges him to a battle. From there, the party ventures to what is by far the largest dungeon in the game, the air castle orbiting the ruins of the planet Parma. Seriously, this place is at least as large as the next two, maybe even next three largest dungeons combined. It's a massive maze with two separate boss fights, both of which are arguably the hardest in the game. Regardless, as Lashiek dies, the party reclaims the Eclipse Torch, escapes the crumbling castle, and can finally make their way to Garoburk Tower. Garoburk Tower feels like a bit of a letdown after how much it's built up and just how massive the air castle was, but the party then has their second encounter against Dark Force, defeating it once again and finally ending the oppressive blizzard that's overtaken all of Dezorus. But just as the party thinks that their quest has come to an end, a massive beam that they can see from nearly half a world away strikes Gumbius Temple, leveling it to the ground. Luckily, the basement is unharmed, and when they return the Eclipse Torch to its sacred resting place, the bishop informs them that the reason that they fought Dark Force twice is because Dark Force itself is just fragments of a greater evil known as the Profound Darkness. It'd be one thing if this evil appeared as a formless black void or something, but what is with these names? First, Dark Force, and now the Profound Darkness? They've come up with all these various names for characters, towns, and planets. Did they just run out of creativity here or something? Regardless, the bishop informs the party that they'll need the arrow prism to reveal Rickrose to them, which Rune, once again using Lutz's memories, in turn explains is hidden back on Otavia. The party ventures back to the warmer planet to find the prism, which guides them to Rickrose, which turns out to be a cloaked planet that only ventures close enough to the rest of the Algo system to be reachable each millennium. Once there, the planet's system, known as the Roof, explains everything to the party, how the Algo system first came into existence, as well as the origin of the Profound Darkness. The Profound Darkness was sealed away 4,000 years ago, with a seal weakest every thousand years, hence the reason each of the games takes place a millennium apart. Planets themselves are what sealed the creature away, and with part of its destruction, and the seal now nearing its weakest point, the profound darkness finally has a chance to escape and utterly destroy all life. Chaz has a bit of a breakdown as he's informed that all of Algo rests upon their shoulders, but Rune assures him that everything will be made clear when they return to the Esper Mansion. There, Chaz takes up the Holy Sword Elsidian, a blade imbued with the spirits of all those who had confronted Dark Force in the past. It shows him all those that had fought up to this point, bolstering his resolve and encouraging him to carry on their legacy. From there, the party returns to Motavia, where all the surviving party members reconvene, making their final preparations for the battle against the Profound Darkness. The team then proceeds to enter the domain of the Profound Darkness and battle it within its own abode before it has the strength to escape. I'll not be showing any footage of the final dungeon since, as I mentioned before, it is an epilepsy hazard. I will, however, say that it's surprisingly straightforward. After the grand labyrinthine design of the air castle, it's really disappointing that the final dungeon is so small and simplistic in comparison. Nevertheless, the party eventually makes their way to the heart of the dungeon and confronts the profound darkness. In typical JRPG fashion, the boss pulls a couple of this isn't even my final form moments, but it's a pretty straightforward fight. As profound darkness is destroyed, the otherworldly dimension collapses, but the souls of Elsidian protect Chaz and his friends long enough for them to escape the ethereal prison, ending the millennial threats to Algo once and for all. From there, everyone parts ways, and I'm a bit confused by the ending. Rem and Demi take the starship, and instead of attempting to re-establish stellar travel within the Algo system, it's implied that the people of Otavia and Tezoris will never see each other again. We also have the typical romantic fake-out, where Rika looks like she's going to leave with Ren and Demi, only to decide at the last point to remain with Chaz. They're assumed to live happily ever after, and the credits roll. Welcome back, Chrononauts! You're just in time to join us for the conclusion. All in all, the story has its strengths and weaknesses alike. Character development is definitely its strongest point, and the stills do a great job of showing facial expressions to further this. 
The plot is much more hit and miss, but overall is solid enough to drive the game forward. Even as someone that's never played Fantasy Star Wide 2, I still found it was easy enough to follow along with the story, though I'm sure there's a great many more references I would have noticed if I was more familiar with those titles. Of course, I have to wonder how much of the story's shortcomings are the fault of the translation. 90s games were notorious for their translations, and much of this was more because of technological limitations rather than due to any lack of effort or skill on the translator's part. Due to the differences between languages, Japanese is able to convey the same meaning in far fewer characters. And because cart space was so limited during this era of gaming, this meant translators were often forced to cut corners to fit everything into the English version of the game. This is also why many names are abbreviated in awkward ways, such as spelling Birth Valley without an E. But as with many JRPGs of this era, there are a number of fan translations out there that don't have to work around these limitations. I don't have the time to give any of them a full playthrough for comparison, but here you can see a little bit of one done by games done legit. If I ever revisit the game, I'll most certainly use this or a similar patch for a more authentic experience, and you may wish to do so from the get-go if you dislike the limitations of the 90s. All in all, Fantasy Star 4 is a solid title that holds up pretty well. It looks good, the characters are well developed, the plot is passable, and it's even a little ahead of its time with the option to talk to your party for a reminder about what you need to do next. It does feel like it begins to drag on a little at the end of everything, but despite its shortcomings, it's an enjoyable journey, and the mixture of space offer helps to make it stand out from the vast number of other high fantasy RPGs out there. I will repeat myself once more that you should not buy this game if you have epilepsy, but for everyone else, I find Fantasy Star 4 to be a classic, or the even 8.4 out of 10. The 16-bit era is often considered the golden age of JRPGs, and it's little wonder why. Personally, I find that nothing tops Live Alive, but what about you? What's your favorite JRPG? And to wrap up Sega Month, what was your favorite title on the Genesis or Mega Drive? If you have any questions, remarks, or opposing points of view, please leave them in the comments down below, and don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and ring that bell. Until next time, farewell, fellow fanatics. Thank you again for watching. I have plenty more to share with you if you're interested. You can click up here above my head to subscribe to my channel. You can click over here on my monitor to see the most recent video that I've worked on. Or if you prefer, you can click up here to open this mysterious vault and see what video that the YouTube algorithm has picked just for you.